Good afternoon. May I ask that you please make sure that your cell phones have been turned off. I'm John Hauser, the President and Executive Director of the George London Foundation for Singers. On behalf of the Foundation and the family, I thank you so much for joining us today to honor our beloved Nora. The George London Foundation is named for one of the most renowned opera stars of the 20th century. George blazed a trail for American singers and created some of the most indelible interpretations of prominent roles. But an equal part of his legacy is the stream of young American and Canadian opera singers whose career path was paved by a George London Award, of which there are currently more than 300. Nora said the foundation was created because George was very much aware of how difficult it was for young singers. When George passed away in 1985, running the foundation became Nora's calling. As she put it, it was the gift he left for me. Over the past 37 years, not only did Nora fulfill George's dream for the foundation, but she also became a matriarch of the opera world in this country, one of its most esteemed figures and certainly one of its most beloved. When I came on board in 2015, I had no idea that over the next seven years, Nora would become one of the most important people in my life. She became the perfect combination of respected colleague, trusted friend, and second mother. As our mutual friend Betsy Crittenton once said, Nora was one of the last true ladies, someone whose class, strength, and integrity, combined with her keen intelligence, humor, and sense of warmth made her a pillar in our world. Today, on behalf of our board, I'm happy to announce the foundation will now be known as the George and Nora London Foundation for Singers. We all feel deeply that this is the best way to honor equally these two giants of opera and continue our work in both their names. Thank you.
scrawny and pale, picking at my food, and lovesick like any other guy. I'd throw away my sweater and dress up like a dude in a dicky and a collar and a tie if I loved you. That was amazing. 
My name is Marina London. I am Nora's daughter, and I'm the vice president of the foundation. As you've read in your programs, this celebration has been generously sponsored by the Lloyd E. Rigler Lawrence E. Deutsch Foundation under the auspices of its president, James Riegler. However, you may not know of the ongoing generous support our foundation receives year after year from Jamie and his foundation. Unfortunately, he cannot be here in person today, though I know he is watching from home. But he wanted me to read some remarks he wrote to explain why he and his family have been involved with the work of Nora and George London for so many years. Quote, my uncle Lloyd and his partner, Lawrence Deutsch, were successful businessmen who supported the musical arts, particularly opera, due to Larry's interest and passion. He was close to George, having been at his 1951 Met debut in Aida, and later meeting Nora and attending the 1955 reopening of the Vienna State Opera House with George's legendary performances as Don Giovanni during that opening week. I first met Nora and George while still in grade school when I visited my uncle and Larry in Los Angeles nearly 60 years ago. Even then, I already knew opera and loved it, a taste acquired by listening to Lloyd and Larry's extensive record collection. As a young adult, having been fortunate to serve two summers as a Santa Fe opera apprentice, I wanted to continue working and studying in London, where I had an opportunity to join the London Opera Center. It was Nora who suggested that I sing for George to see what he thought of my going to live and sing there. At that time, they lived in Washington, DC, where I went to sing for George and get his opinion. He told me I should definitely go to study, sing, and live there, forever impacting my life in music, for which I remain eternally grateful to this very day. With Larry Deutsch's untimely passing, my uncle grew closer to both Nora and George. He served with George on a number of arts-related panels and saw firsthand their great interest in helping young singers navigate the difficulties of a life in music. Later on, when talking about George's great recordings with Nora, I realized how knowledgeable she was about music, voices, and artists, including their special needs and attributes. Seeing operas with her was always a special experience, whether it was at the Met or the Vienna State Opera. I went with Lloyd to see Nora during Georgia's last years. Her dedication to him was inspiring. Her determination to continue his incredible legacy with young singers was impressive and Lloyd agreed then to help support such a meaningful and important organization, protecting the future of vocal performance as an art form. The two tribute concerts organized in part by her during his final years were testaments to George's impact on the world of music, with luminaries such as Leonie Rizanek, James King, Dame Joan Sutherland, Nikolai Geda, and Edita Gruberova all lending their talents to honor him as a man and artist. When Lloyd was in his final illness, he wanted to take a last drive through the countryside outside of New York. It was dear Nora herself who drove him around for that nostalgic afternoon before he passed soon after. It was Nora who flew to California to speak at Lloyd's memorial at the Egyptian Theater nearly 20 years ago. I know she would be pleased with the addition of a third generation of families serving on the board of the foundation and with John Hauser's continuing leadership role. How fitting to add Nora's name to the foundation, making it the George and Nora London Foundation for Singers. Long may it continue. Thank you. Good afternoon. Philip, Andy, Marina, Mark. I'm here to speak of this remarkable, extraordinary woman. Dearest, dearest Nora. I met Nora at a dinner at her house in Chevy Chase in 1973, almost 50 years ago, my goodness. Uh, 
George and I had met up on an airplane, which was delayed, can you imagine? Uh, in 1973, I was heading to the Leonard Bernstein Peace Concert, and he home to Chevy Chase. And because of the delay, which was three or four hours, we had a chance to really talk on the plane, sitting next to each other. And as we finished, he took me in a taxi from Reagan Airport, which was then National, Washington National. Um, a lot of things have changed in 50 years. <laughs> um, George said to me, oh, you must come to dinner. We must meet more, Nora. Well, very soon thereafter, he invited me, and I, I came. And that dinner, I don't know why, but it's stuck in my memory all these years. How beautiful was that dinner? How exquisite the food, how elegant the wines, everything about what she did in that evening, the way that house was run, and you could be sure she was running that house. <laughs> Mark and Marina were away at school, but we had the most exquisite evening with the dogs. They were there. <laughs> and it was beautiful, and I remember it so well because I was absolutely um, taken with this remarkable woman. And, you know, I saw her from time to time when George started to run the National Washington Opera. Uh, I was there for several of the productions, and we had parties and so on and so on. But the next thing was when George had this dreadful uh, heart attack in Munich in 1977. And it, it was just uh, terrible for, for, for his friends, for me, for others. But, of course, it was the worst for his family and, and for Nora. And we got into, immediately got into contact a, a great deal and uh, I kept in touch with her very closely during that period because, of course, it was a tough, tough time for her. Um, she, she lived in Westchester from 1979 to 1987, and I visited a couple of times. Uh, George was truly like Amfortas. He was completely wounded during this period. It was the most terrible thing to observe. And, and she tended him and took care of him with such devotion and love. It was an extraordinary, extraordinary time. So one thing that one could do to help was to find out a way to, to honor and raise funds. And so a concert in Washington, D.C. Was, uh, was launched. And amazing, that was when all those great singers that I've just mentioned came and sang for him. Beverly Sills, John Sutherland, Trianos, uh, Evelyn Lear and Tom Stewart, everybody. And it was an extraordinary event. And I got to know uh, 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 John Wahlberg during this period very well. And um, we also worked on a concert with Nora in Vienna in 1984, which also was mentioned a moment ago. Uh, that in these two events, I realized how strong and clever and, and artistically apt was Nora. And then, then at the end of this terrible time for her, and let's be honest, she had gone through a terrible time coming to America during the Second World War. Terrible. And I mean, she finally, years after, told me the story of her, her route from Berlin through Paris and through Portugal and South America. You know, those days were not dissimilar to now. That was extremely difficult to get into this country at that time. But when George finally passed, in 1985, uh, Nora moved into New York and started into a whole different period of her life. And out of this, the suffering and sadness that she had gone through for eight terrible years, she, with incredible courage and strength, formed a new life for herself and took up this foundation and made it live in a way that so it affected the entire last 30 years of American opera. Uh, she presented the first concert in this hall, uh, in the other hall upstairs, uh, in 1996, I think, with Rene Fleming. Uh, and then, subsequently, when this hall was open, she did an incredible series of concerts in this hall, uh, I think that have made a real impact on New York's cultural life and given a chance for young American singers to be heard, in many cases, for the first time in New York, and certainly many of them in recital for the first time. Nora's life was a combination of tragedy and triumph. Her grace, her charm, but also her strength and wit and intelligence made her a very great woman, and I am deeply moved to hear that you have changed the name of the foundation, and I cannot say how thrilled I am. A life superbly well-led, 
a long life and a great life with all of my love to you, Nora. Bravo. Stage crew, too. <laughs> I'm just going to say one quick thing, because <clears throat> there's going to be a lot of beautiful things said about Nora today. And uh, all I was, wanted to say was, since, uh, since I won the, my George London Award, I don't believe Nora missed a single one of the things that I did in New York, ever. She always wrote, I'm coming backstage. I... I mean, I, I just, like, even my parents couldn't say the same. And uh, so there, there will be lots of other things said, but I'm just really grateful that you asked me to be here and uh, grateful that I could sing for Nora and for you um, in this place, which I also have been lucky enough to have done two recitals here, one with uh, Flicka as the young artist and one as the, as the artist who's grown up uh, with a young soprano, so uh, I've benefited in tremendous ways from uh, from this foundation and from Nora's love. So, this is Eluce van le Stelle. <clears throat>
Good afternoon. I'm the third, and very much the third, in the procession of Matthews today. <laughs> we didn't plan it this way, I promise. My name is Matthew Horner, and in my day job, I'm head of vocal and executive vice president of IMG Artists. More importantly for today, however, I'm deeply proud to be a member of the George, London, George and Nora London Foundation's board, and I'm so grateful to Nora's children and grandchildren for having asked me to speak today. It's a profound honor indeed to pay tribute to this utterly remarkable woman that I was fortunate enough to call my friend for more than 25 years. Nora admired succinct expression and brevity, and I will attempt to hone in my prolix tendencies and comply with her wishes. <laughs> If there was anyone that I thought would make it to 100 or beyond, it was Nora, along with another celebrated nonagenarian whose funeral was tomorrow. Her life, in US terms at least, spanned the presidencies from Calvin Coolidge to Joe Biden. Think of that for just a moment. I still somehow expect to see her when I leave Lincoln Center walking her dachshunds around the building. Within the remarkable near century that Nora was with us, 25 years may seem a trifling amount of time. We first met through my former boss and great mentor, Matthew Epstein, from whom you've already heard. Despite a mere 46-year age gap, we hit it off immediately. Nora attended my 30th birthday luncheon, which Matthew sponsored, in the company of Marilyn Horn, Teresa Stratus, and our colleagues Andy Melanot and Karen Ashley at Café des Artistes. Nora then invited me for a solo lunch at Café des Artistes, and I was a bit intimidated. I had already read Aria for George and knew of her and this exceptional life of hers. But we, we got on like wildfire once again. We stayed at Café des Artistes for a few years and then moved on to Fiorello's rather grudgingly on both of our parts. <laughs> <laughs> and then I remember Nora's extraordinary and palpable joy when Bouloud sued <laughs> open, and we spent many more years enjoying great food and radiant conversations. Nora charmed the staff in perfect French and we were treated like royalty. When I first came to know Nora, I wanted to talk voraciously about the past. I wanted to hear about Wilan Wagner or Astrid Varnay, about Imgard Seyfried or Sani Jurinach, about Tebaldi or Siepi, all of whom had been her friends in George's. She indulged me in this, but I soon realized that our friendship would not simply be a history lesson. One of Nora's most extraordinary qualities was her contemporaneity. She had lived a remarkable life and she knew it, but the present kept her equally engaged. She was also deeply curious about new singers that I'd heard or wanting to tell me the latest from her trips and how she visited with Hilda Zadek or Elu Gaussmann or Gottfried Krauss. She, I also loved calling her from the road from Vienna or Munich or Berlin to say I'd found a new recording of George. And she would always be so excited in almost a girlish way and then usually describe the performance with perfect recollection. She always spoke well of singers and didn't engage in pernicious gossip. She devoted herself for decades to their betterment and clearly revered their art. As the years passed by, we came, became more personal and philosophical. She told me just a few years ago, I think Americans are too preoccupied with affairs. <laughs> Another tangent led us to a tale she told me about a legendary singer that she and George knew quite well. This man had had a male partner or secretary or companion or whatever the euphemism of the time was. And with her characteristic lilt, she told me, imagine my surprise when he turned up married to a woman. I had to call George to try to figure out what happened. <laughs> Pearls of laughter followed, as they often did. Or about two renowned sopranos. One, she always had women lovers. Everyone knew it and nobody cared. Why do they care now? <laughs> or regarding another soprano, I knew that she and George had dated before I knew him. I didn't care, but she certainly did. <laughs> For me, as so many have remarked already, Nora embodied a term that is perhaps now a little bit out of vogue. She was in every positive sense a lady. Her clothing, her hair, her makeup, yes, even her cane in later years, but, but or anything, more than anything, an intrinsic elegance and an aristocratic bearing that we don't see very much in the world today. Nora's passing leaves a very profound gap in my life. She was only a few years younger than my grandmother's, and she was my last living connection to the so-called greatest generation that Tom Brokaw spoke about in his book several decades ago. The unique heroism of the, this generation that witnessed the Second World War and that was shaped by the Great Depression won't ever be equaled. Likewise, I know that my friendship with Nora will have no equal, nor should it. I was fortunate enough to be part of her earthly journey. Nora, you're deeply missed. Ruhe sanft.
Hello, I am Harolyn Blackwell, and I'm so glad to join all of you today in celebrating my dear friend, Nora London. My connection to the London Foundation dates back to my college years, when I auditioned for the awards program. I didn't advance beyond the first round of the competition, but I did meet George London. And I remember how gracious and kind he was. He instantly made me feel at ease during the audition. Years later, I had the great fortune of meeting Nora through our mutual friend, Craig Rutenberg. And that was truly the beginning of a beautiful friendship. I discovered we shared a Washington, D.C. connection. I was born and educated in Washington, D.C. Nora and George lived there for many years when George was the director of the Kennedy Center, National Opera Institute, and the Washington Opera. And what we discovered was that their children had attended the same school as several of my nieces and nephews, Murray. Family was so important to Nora, and how our families were doing was always the main topic of our conversation at our regular lunches at Bar Bulu across from Lincoln Center. Yes, we were truly the ladies that lunched, <laughs> except without the martinis. Our luncheons were a minimum of three hours, with us talking about everything, family, politics, the foundation, and of course, her beloved George. Often, she would share stories with me about herself and her history. What a life she had. Those get-togethers were wonderful and very precious to me, and I will miss them greatly. We were also colleagues. We served together on the music committee here at the Morgan Library. And around 10 years ago, Nora asked if I would join the jury of the George London Foundation competition. Well, whenever, call, whenever Nora would call with that request, only thing I could say was, yes. <laughs> she wouldn't take no for an answer, but it was yes. And so began the decade of participation in this wonderful event that lifts young singers and helps boost them into a career. Both George and Nora had also, since the beginning, actively encouraged singers of color. You can see this in the list of George London Award winners and recitalists of the past 50 years. This is yet something else that made them so special. Ask George Shirley, another longtime friend of George and Nora's and my fellow competition judge. Now, during the competition semifinals, I always had the great pleasure of sitting in front of Nora. And the highlight of the semifinals was Nora's commentary on the proceedings, <laughs> in which her excitement about the young singers would mix with her impish sense of humor. And often, she would start her commentary as the singer was leaving the hall. <laughs> and we would be holding our breath, hoping the singer did not hear her. But she made hearing 20 singers per day for a week so much fun. When Nora asked me to join the board of the foundation, I was thrilled and honored to be able to give back to the foundation that she loved and cherished. A couple weeks ago, Queen Elizabeth passed, and I thought of Nora, another woman who assumed leadership in what was certainly a male-dominated field. And over the past decades, through her tenacity and strength, earned the respect and admiration of everyone in it. I know Nora would not have wanted to be compared to the Queen. I know that. But like her, Nora was a woman whose like we will not see again. From this friend and admirer, thank you, Nora. I thank you for your wonderful friendship, and thank you for all the difference you have made in our lives. I know your magnificent light will continue to shine brightly 
through your family, through your friends and colleagues, and now through the George and Nora London Foundation. Thank you. Well, on behalf of my sister, my brothers, my cousin, our spouses, her 10 grandchildren, and three great-grandchildren, I want to thank you for attending and participating in this service in the celebration of the life of our revered and much-loved matriarch, Nora London. It's going to be tough. <laughs> this is a very emotional setting here in this auditorium because many of us, I'll bet you maybe all of us, saw her give those little talks before or after whatever, the competition and the concerts. She was such an amazing speaker and you would just never expect it. It would come out, just perfect syntax in what was not her native tongue. So it's, it's just, I just picture her right, right there. So mommy, or, or granny, as our family called her, was absolutely the central person in our lives, in my case, for 75 years. We were indelibly tied to her, not just as a family relationship, but also by some kind of intangible, almost supernatural bond. Her singular and most impressive characteristic was that she was incredibly intelligent and smart, and sometimes annoyingly so. <laughs> Whether it was her beloved husband, George, or any of us children, we all hesitated to ask her opinion because it often disagreed with uh, disagreed with our ideas, and she was always, and I mean always, right <laughs> about everything. Should George sing a particular role? Should he trust so-and-so? Almost always an emphatic no. <laughs> Should one of us go on a date with so-and-so? Spend the summer doing this or that? She had some innate compass or knowledge that defied understanding. It was as frustrating as it was unfathomable. Of course, I don't think she could have graced all of us with her 98 and a half foot years had she not been some kind of genius in dealing with the challenges that she encountered. Just take a glancing look at her life. Growing up in Berlin under the eye of her Russian parents, including her amazing father, Jacob Shapiro, an engineering and financial mastermind and millionaire who at one time controlled over 40% of the German auto industry, including Daimler-Benz. And then having to abandon all that, losing it all to escape Hitler and the Nazis. Then, my mother went on to Paris for her adolescence in a slightly more modest lifestyle with her mother Jean and Uncle Senya, and then chased, literally this time, out of France, ending up in New York. By the time she was 17, she had lived in three countries and was fluent in Russian, German, French, and English. She had to endure the loss of both her father and husband at an early age. And she was not only smart and worldly wise, she was also stunningly beautiful. Check, you saw the pictures in the video. 
The legend is that Hollywood producers tried to recruit her to be in the movies. Instead, my mother married my father, Gene, and brought Andy and I into this world. I think she felt she had much in common with him since he was also Russian, French, American. After that marriage ended, she met the true love of her life at a party of Russian, French immigrants, many of whom were involved in opera. I'm not sure of the details, but I believe it was love at first sight and her passion for George and his for her dominated her life for the next 30 some years. They married and brought Marina and Mark into this world, into our family. My mother's love for George was of the deepest and most passionate kind, which is understandable to anyone who ever met George. He was everything you have ever heard about him multiplied by a hundred. Words cannot describe how devastating his illness and death was to my mother. But, as usual, she persevered and entered the next and final and long chapter of her life when she was on her own, but with many friends as well as family, and took over the George London Foundation devoting herself to the nurturing of the many voices that went on to dominate opera houses throughout the world. And we can't forget her profound love of animals. You saw just a few of the dogs <laughs> in the video. Her dogs were intrinsically, intrinsically linked to her life story. One day, while living in Paris, her uncle came rushing home and told my mother and grandmother to pack up. They had to leave today from France immediately because the Nazis had crossed the Maginot Line and were marching rapidly towards Paris. My mother said, OK, but on one condition. She had to be able to bring along her cherished Airedale, Peter. It was an amazing and long life. If you watch the video, you, will, you saw hundreds of pictures of her in countless settings and times. While packing up her apartment after her very peaceful passing, we made an amazing discovery. Unbeknownst to anyone besides herself, she had kept a diary from January 1st, 1940, just eight days from her 16th birthday, to January 3rd, 1943, which Marina has brilliantly translated from the French. Much of it was a teenager's chronicle of her love life, but it included the time when she escaped from France and came to the US. There are a couple of entries which I would like to share with you. On February 9th, 1940, she wrote, quote, music, now this is at age 16 or 15. Music is a wonderful art. And on April 29, she went on to say, every day I love music more. Not the current popular music, but classical compositions that I can delve into ever deeper, little by little. I now understand a type of music which was leaving me cold only a few months ago. Creativity is wonderful. So as early as age 16, she became attuned to the music which dominated her life in later years. Then, on May 17, 1940 through May 21st, as the Germans were advancing on Paris, she wrote, they are advancing. They are killing everyone as they move. The situation is bad. We have to leave, leave Paris, suitcases, more suitcases, books. I'm tired. Life is only made of sad departures. From now on, hope will be followed by more departures. But then she wrote, but I love life. 
Her last entry was on January 3rd, 1943, less than a year after her father died. And she said, I have tried to overcome my pain, to return to the life I love more than anything, and to continue to carry through the strength of my own life, the dead flame of the life of Papa. And thus it was in her own words that throughout her life she faced crushing sadness and loss, but came through it for another day. Whether you were a member of her family or a colleague working in opera or a friend, my mother was somehow omnipresent. You could feel her being, even if you were thousands of miles away. Her beautiful mind penetrated the ether in some mysterious way. She could touch your thoughts with just a few words of advice. And even today, weeks after her passing, she is present. I think of her every morning. Recalling those memorable breakfasts, we had when she visited my wife Angela and I at our Colorado ranch. There she was, seemingly as comfortable in that rural environment as she had been in the capitals of Europe and America. She even went with us to a small town rodeo. <laughs> Her absence leaves all of us with a feeling of incompleteness like we should be able to turn our heads and see her or hear her. But I can assure you that if she were still here in the flesh, she would want each of you to make the best of your lives. Don't be dismayed by setbacks and push for the survival of common sense and thoughtfulness. Thank you. Joyce Di Donato. Hundred years ago, I was a very eager and excited winner of the George London Foundation, one of the first awards that I ever got, and I thought maybe I have a chance. Um, I am deeply honored to have been asked to be here today uh, and to celebrate her life in song, which, as we just heard, she loved so dearly. The connection to music in her life. I'm not sure how you pick a song, one song, for a life of Nora, but it felt like it should be French, and it felt like it should be a love song. This is by Rinaldo Hahn, and it's Ah Cloris, and essentially it just basically says that the love that is felt for Cloris is so pure, even the kings in heaven probably don't really understand the beauty of loving somebody with such beautiful eyes, which we saw at the start. This is Acloris.
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Eric Wahlberg. I'm one of Nora's 10 grandchildren. <clears throat> wow. And it is my honor to speak with you today. <clears throat> As a new treasurer of the George and Nora London Foundation for Seniors, I, along with my cousin Katrina, am honored with the responsibility of being the third generation of our family to sit on the board of this foundation. This foundation has always been a way for me to have a connection with my grandfather, whom I never had the opportunity to know. Now it will serve to continue my connection with my grandmother, who fortunately graced my life for 28 years. <clears throat> My job is to close out the event, actually, so let me, let me do that. <laughs> uh, I want to, of course, thank the Lord E. Riegler and Lawrence E. Deutsch Foundation and Jamie Riegler for sponsoring this wonderful gathering, and of course, the singers and speakers that spoke beautifully and sang beautifully. Um, finally, I'd, of course, want to thank John Hauser uh, and, and, and Margarita Martinez for their tireless work on behalf of this foundation and without whom this event would not be possible. Uh, there is a reception uh, outside in the hall, which of course you're all uh, welcome to join. Um, before I let you do that, uh, when I had the honor of reading a eulogy for my grandmother at the private funeral we had with my family, I read something to console them. <laughs> I guess I need it now. Uh, I want to read it for you all now. It is said that Mozart never died. He simply turned into music. Like Mozart, Nora London will not die. She turned into the bonds that tie my family together, and now into the legacy that is this foundation. Thank you. <clears throat> 